to Research in Progress. This is a series where our scholars working on AU2030 projects bring us up to date on the things that they've been working on and the projects that they have in front of them. I'm Nancy Dockport, and I'm the University Librarian. And on behalf of all of my colleagues in the library, we're delighted to host this because we think the library is one of those places where all kinds of interdisciplinary work sort of finds its home, since we have something for everyone. I have the honor of also introducing the panelists, and I will be introducing them in the order in which they're going to speak today. So we will start off with Professor Terry Heyer. Um, professor Heyer is an associate professor in the Department of Public Administration and Policy. His research focuses on the processes of neighborhood change with an emphasis on housing, metropolitan politics, and race. He is the author of The New Urban Renewal, The Economic Transformation of Harlem and Bronzeville, published by the University of Chicago in 2008. He recently completed his second book, Making of the Gilded Ghetto, Race, Class, and Politics in the Cappuccino City, also published by the University of Chicago Press in its fourth book which investigates the redevelopment of Washington, D.C.'s U Street Shaw neighborhood. He holds a degree, a PhD from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's degree from Kobe University. Michael Bader. Dr. Bader researches cities and ways in which people interact within the built environment. His scholarship focuses on racial and economic segregation, neighborhood inequality, and health and nutrition disparities. He's also interested in social science methodology. Bader is collaborating with colleagues from Columbia University to evaluate the effectiveness of Google Street View as an alternative to costly in-person neighborhood audits. He comes to AU from the University of Pennsylvania, where he worked as a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholar since 2009. He'll be working with the Center on Health, Risk, and Society within the Department of Sociology. He holds a PhD in Sociology from the University of Michigan and a BA in Architecture and Art History from Rice University. Malini Raghunathan is an interdisciplinary urban geographer with a special interest in post-colonial theory and urbanism. Her scholarship on the politics and the discourses surrounding urban infrastructure and natures seeks to enrich what we know about capitalism citizenship, and sustainability in the world's most urbanizing regions. Her work contributes to the cross-cutting fields of urban political ecology, critical urban studies, and ethnographies of state formation and development. Her PhD is from the University of California at Berkeley. And Bradley Hardy is an associate professor of public administration and policy. His research interests lie within labor economics with an emphasis on economic instability, intergenerational mobility, poverty policy, and socioeconomic outcomes. Within the department, he teaches courses on microeconomics and social policy. His research examines trends and sources of income volatility and intergenerational mobility within the United States, with a particular focus on socioeconomic, economically disadvantaged families. A PhD in economics from the University of Kentucky, a master's in public policy from Georgetown University, and a BA in economics from Morehouse College. We're delighted to have all of you in the library to present your research and start discussions with all of us. Thank you for coming. Derek, you're going to begin? Please. Dr. Bass, the provost, will do an intro to this program. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, it is April Fool's Day, so I'm you know, surprised. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the session on urban research. Uh, as you know, embedded in our mission is a deep commitment to the great issues of our time. And we don't have to look any further than our backyard in terms of the DC as a laboratory, as we come to call it, with intractable issues that we are interested in and study from poverty, homelessness, crime inequality, race relations, educational disparity, sustainability, gentrification and many more are right at our doorstep. These issues and the interaction of these issues with policies and processes of governments mirror the challenge faced by citizens and governments in cities across the United States and throughout the world. And we've chosen to actively address these pressing issues and we've done so with a firm belief 
that challenging issues should not and cannot be effectively addressed through the lens of a single disciplinary perspective. The Metropolitan Policy Center, which you'll hear more about, is one of AU's newest centers and was created in 2014 as part of the AU 2030 <coughs> initiative uh, to study uh, as a study of interdisciplinary perspectives of some of the aforementioned issues I've outlined. AU 2030, as you may know, was developed to identify and promote groundbreaking areas of scholarly exploration with a special emphasis in cross-disciplinary and emerging fields. Now, some of you may recall how this was created, is that um, part of AU 2030 was to ask the faculty to identify areas that they thought the institution should have a preeminent role as we look to the future, and that would influence hiring in all the schools and colleges. Um, there were many suggestions brought forward that was narrowed through a process that involved the deans, and a trigger was then a series of fora that involved faculty right after uh, commencement where um, faculty could come together on subject areas. I was surprised, given the history of this institution, to see that among the topic areas that faculty showed up and wanted to discuss, metropolitan and urban issues was at the top of the list. Over 40 people showed up at the session at a rather an inconvenient time to spend an entire day on the subject. So it seemed to us that while it was not part of the institutional planning at that time, that that would be incorporated in the allocation of lines. Each of the schools have benefited from that, um, and it has resulted in the, in the most recent hiring of Derek Hira and the creation of the center to uh, continue this initiative. And there, as we sit down, we'll be sitting down in two weeks to begin looking at existing positions is that these remain a priority for the institution uh, in terms of directions we are headed. Um, true to its interdisciplinary focus, the Metropolitan Policy Center, MPC, has established an extraordinary interdisciplinary team of 13 fellows, and they are across all of our academic units. Since its establishment, the center has done the following. It's created a dynamic AU urban research culture through an urban speaker series, uh, which has brought to campus some of the leading urban scholars, a public engagement uh, series, uh, which brings urban practitioners to campus, an annual spring lecture, which this year some of you were at, with Julius, Julius Wilson, who's a renowned Harvard sociologist on issues of race, poverty, and inner cities. Uh, they have allocated grants of $10,000 each to faculty teams, including one on African-American historic preservation, uh, gentrification, and climate change and urban sustainability. They secured a book contract with Rutledge uh, entitled uh, Capital Dilemma, Growth and Inequality in Washington, D.C. They received a research contract from the National Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders um, that looks at uh, U.S. minority and small business lending practices. MPC has associated scholars and have articles featured in some top journals such as Urban Studies, Urban Geography, Journal of Urban Affairs, and the research has been featured in the Washington Post, Governing Magazine, and Atlantic City Lab publication. MTC scholars have also, also translated their findings into practical policy recommendations for national and local audiences. For example, they met with the Small Business Administration representatives and advised the organization. It's an impressive list of accomplishments when you need to recognize this center has existed for less than two semesters. Before we hear from the presentations, I'd like to recognize and thank Derek Pyro for his leadership in the, as the inaugural director of the Metropolitan Policy Center. And I want to also thank um, Dean Romzek, who's not here, uh, who has helped uh, support uh, this event. So thank you for all being here, and I look forward to hearing from Papers. Pat, there. Thank you. All right. So, thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to thank 
Nancy Davenport for hosting us here at the library. And I want to thank the Provost Scott Pass for that uh, great introduction, um, and also Dean Romzik, who's my dean in the School of Public Affairs. Uh, Scott and Barbara really worked together to pull together the resources to implement the vision of the faculty here, and I commend um, both of you for the leadership and, and having uh, MPC be created. Uh, so we've only been around for seven months, uh, but we have a lot to say and we got a lot going on. Um, so let me get started with the presentation and I just want to say what I'm going to do is give an overview of MPC and then just give you a, a little sliver of my <coughs> research and then we'll turn it over to the other panelists who are all faculty affiliates and faculty fellows of the Metropolitan Policy Center. So let's talk about MPC's mission. It is to cultivate cross-disciplinary metropolitan and urban research that helps to advance urban theory, public policy, but most importantly, to improve people's lives. We do this research, yes, to publish our books and journals, but in the end, we want it to be translated into practical policy solutions to help people uh, and, and improve people's lives. To do this, we have to garner uh, a lot of external resources. We have some from the provost and from uh, Barbara Romzik, but we, we need more. So we are going after external grants to undergird that research. We also are going to demonstrate AU's engagement in Washington, D.C., and I'll talk a little bit about that more in the presentation. Now, Scott already mentioned all the things that we're doing, so uh, we'll just skip that slide. But please, come, come to our events. Now, we did have William Julius Wilson, uh, who came uh, just last month, and it was in the Founders Room, and there were over 170 people at this event. Now, the only other AU event that I've been to with that many people was when the provost talked to the entire faculty <laughs> in that room. So it's just amazing that we were able to pull together that many people uh, for an urban event here on campus. So the context. Why MPC? Yes, a lot of faculty wanted to see a metropolitan center at American University, but, but why? What's going on in the world and in our country that justifies looking at urban areas? Well, <coughs> one we just see, I mean, a lot of you already know this, but the, a population has dramatically increased in metropolitan and urban places since the 60s. Uh, this projected by 2050, over 70% of the world's population will live in a metropolitan space. Now, most of this growth is in Africa and East Asia, uh, but we should remember that the most urbanized area in the world is Latin America, and also in the U.S., we have some a phenomenon that's you know unbelievable current. We have this back to the city movement, right? We had this great suburbanization happening in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. In the 90s and 2000s, we have people returning to the city center. So. These urban areas are, have a lot of complexities and a lot of contradictions. They are the engine of economic growth, innovation, and creativity, but they are also the places of immense concentrated poverty, inequality, and segregation. This kind of sounds like Washington, D.C., so I know a lot of you live there, but this isn't just Washington, D.C., right? This is every urban metropolitan space that I've ever visited around the world. So what are some of the big questions that MPC is going to try to tackle in the coming years. Uh, first, we are going to look with this population influx to urban areas. How is that changing urban politics and civil <coughs> society? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that with my own research. Uh, but Mike Bader is probably going to talk about how this population influx is creating new types of communities. New spatial forms are happening in the city centers, but also in the inner suburbs. Uh, we also, uh, Balani's work is really going to focus on how do we facilitate equitable and sustainable economic development. We have a lot of development going on, but you know, with climate change and with vulnerable populations, how are we going to sustain that? And Bradley's work really focuses on how to reduce inequality. How do we minimize poverty in urban spaces? So let me now just talk about my uh, own research a little bit. And you know, what are the new urban politics of these centers that are having the back to the city movement uh, in the U.S.? Now, most of my research in the last six, seven years has focused on Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. from 2000 to 2010 had a 5.2 percent population increase. The majority of that population were young and white. In that time period, over 50,000 whites moved into Washington, D.C. And this has changed the political dynamics of this city. So let's just take a look. This is uh, the 2010 uh, population uh, in this graph here. 
in Washington, D.C., the areas in the dark green have 75% or more people who are African American living in those areas, and 0 to 25% uh, African Americans living in the lighter color areas. I mean, you guys know D.C., right? I mean, this is all African American, this is all white. But what you see kind of running down here are these mixed race, mixed income communities, that Shaw where I've studied for the last couple of years. Um, but if we would have looked at the 2000, we would have seen this whole area be dark green. So the city with that population influx of the young millennials who are mainly white is, is definitely uh, changing. DC, used African Americans used to be the majority of the population. They are not anymore. Um, and that has changed the political circumstances. So let's just look a little bit uh, at Washington, D.C. Um, you see D.C. is known for the carryouts, right? Tally's Corner was written here in the 60s. It still has a number of carryouts. Uh, those carryouts, a lot of them are being displaced. That carryout in particular, which is on 14th and W, is no longer there. It's a high-end Mexican restaurant. Um, and then you see here, you've got, you can see the condos, the luxury high-rises are coming in, squeezing in on the Blues Club that has been there since uh, the, the 50s. You've got the new preferences and amenities that the millennials want, ballet barking, right? I mean, it, it's a doggy daycare. You drop your dog off, you go into work downtown. Uh, I see people driving down 9th Street with their Range Rovers and Mercedes. The dog hops out. They, you know, spend the day there. Uh, they pick them up when they come home from work. Uh, but also you see the bike lanes, right? Um, the bike lanes and the bike share are coming in into communities that are predominantly African American. I mean, you think this elderly couple is going to take out one of those bikes and, and hop on? Uh, I don't know. But as Sonia Greer, who's also a faculty fellow at the Pogod School, but she's a faculty fellow at NPC, has talked about the politics of D.C. or the politics of dog parks, coffee shops, and, and bike lanes. So we have seen a political shift with the millennials coming into the city. Uh, so Giovanni. Uh, Giovanni is the first white uh, civic association president of the Bay Street Association, which used to be for decades dominated by African Americans. He says, you look at the city that was historically a black city run by blacks. Now you look at the black population and the projections are that the district will look more like California uh, by the end of 10 years, where there will be more ethnicities and it will be more multiracial. So I think that they, black native Washingtonians, are like, oh my god, we used to run the city. So what you see is the ANC structure, the civic association, the newcomers are coming in and taking over the political system. For the first time since home rule, uh, the DC city council is majority white. There's still an African American mayor, but the city council is white. So this is really no longer a chocolate city. This is the cappuccino city. So we see home rule. Now home rule came into Washington DC in 1973. Homes rule stood for the height of chocolate city. This was black empowerment coming out of the civil rights movement and moving into the city bureaucracy system. Uh, the black empowerment that came to D.C. during the early Marion Barry years represented the best, right? Uh, but now, ideas of home rule, our home rule is on 14th Street, it's a boutique, right? I mean, and that's kind of the notion, home rule has changed. So, the politics of Washington, D.C. has changed. Now, this is not just happening in Washington, D.C. I was just on a panel in New Orleans with scholars from around the country, the politics of Newark, the politics of New Orleans and places like this that used to be majority black and had black power bases are shifting. So what we're seeing <coughs> in D.C. is telling of what's happening around the country. So what we are trying to do at MPC is build a D.C. school of knowledge. A DC school of knowledge because this is an advanced service sector economy. The economy here used to be dominated by the federal government, it still plays a large role, but the private sector uh, is playing a larger role more than it's ever had. And this is an advanced service sector economy, and this type of economy will be the economy of growing cities in the US and around the world. So, what we detect, what we see, the new spatial formations will be the formations of other cities. Now, Scott has talked about all the things that we have going on related to what's happening in DC. I'm not going to go over all of them, but uh, Mike Bader uh, does have, uh, we are launching a survey that was funded primarily by internal resources to look at the DC metropolitan region and what's happening in some of the most diverse uh, areas. Now, we aren't the urban center, we are the metropolitan center. And this map sort of shows you why. If you're interested in new spatial forms of racial diversity, you're really not going to look to Washington, D.C. You're going to look to the suburban ring. Um, so Mike created this map. Uh, 
and this is undergirding sort of his survey that he's about to uh, uh, launch. But what you see here is the areas that are purple are these areas that are global communities. These are areas that have 10% or more African Americans, Latinos, whites, and Asians. So they are extremely diverse. The areas uh, that are in blue, those are the Latino enclaves. So the Latino enclaves used to be in the central cities. Well, now they're in the inner suburbs. So if you want to understand racial diversity in the US, you need to look at not just the inner city and the central city, you have to look at the inner suburbs. So this import justifies why we are the metropolitan center. So, uh, like I said, we've got uh, a lot to say and a lot going on. Uh, we would love for you to join us. Uh, we have our, our website, Facebook, and Twitter. We pump out a, a lot of stuff uh, that we are doing. So please, you know, check us out. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike. Thank you. And, and for hosting us, and Scott, for all the support that you've given the Metropolitan Policy effort on campus. It's been really, truly great to get to know colleagues across campus and to have Derek join us to, to help lead the effort. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I see. Um, that Derek's talk actually leads very nicely into mine. I'm thinking about what the past, present, and future of metro changes in, in the United States. And I'm gonna preface this by saying that I'm still relatively new here, so my work on DC is evolving. Um, so most examples you'll see during my talk are from cities or metro areas not that are not DC. Um, but my work seeks to explain how neighborhoods have changed since the height of the civil rights movement and how those changes affect inequality. So what I'm really interested in is saying this massive movement in the 1960s that changed that had two fundamental changes to American society. The first one being outlawing discrimination, which is what we typically think about. The second one being the last time major immigration reform was passed in the United States. When we talk about immigration reform now, what we're talking about is reforming the 1965 Immigration Act that was passed by Congress and Lyndon Johnson as part of the Civil Rights Movement. Now that latter part is what makes it possible to have such a diverse a racially and ethnically diverse country in the United States because it got rid of quotas and made it possible for uh, especially Latinos and Asians to be able to immigrate to the United States compared to before it was essentially um, Western Southern Europeans. And so what I'm, one of the major projects I'm working on, which I'll give you just a little bit of a snippet on today, is the post-civil rights neighborhood racial trajectories. And so the argument that I make, and this paper is I shouldn't say this, I'm going to jinx it, but conditionally accepted recently, so hopefully it will be fully accepted soon. But in it, we argue that the contemporary problem of racial segregation is not white flight, but of gradual racial succession, which is a different perspective than what lots of people have kind of said. And so what we argue in the paper is that the um, estimates of racial integration are actually overestimates of how much racial integration there is in the United States because they don't account for this very gradual racial succession. And I want to give just a, a brief demo on, on what I mean by that. So if you imagine these are our neighborhoods, each household, the, the squares here, it's an all-white neighborhood, let's say 1970, and you have um, an African-American resident move in, their neighbors suddenly flee, their neighbors flee, and so what you end up with is a very rapid change from being all-white to all-black, typically within a, about a decade, maybe 15 years. In contrast, what we're much more likely to see now is one of what I call gradual racial succession. So that same person leaves, but now the neighbors are fine, white neighbors are fine with that person staying there and being happy in the neighborhood, but eventually they move for other reasons, right? They get a new job, they get divorced, they get married, they have kids, um, they retire, or they, they pass away. So in the long run, you know, as Kane said, we're all dead. And so, um, and so eventually those whites move out, and whites are unwilling to even consider neighborhoods that are integrated. Right? So not just the predominantly black neighborhoods, or predominantly Hispanic neighborhoods, or predominantly Asian neighborhoods, but even integrated neighborhoods are unattractive to whites, which is the focus of another area of my research, which is um, thinking about what these are maps that we gave people um, in the Chicago metropolitan area. We gave them maps. We had 41 communities labeled on. You can kind of see them outlined here, the city of Chicago. 
um, follows this outline right here, and say where would you consider moving, where would you never consider moving, and so these are the maps on where you would never consider moving, and what you see is that whites basically don't want to live, well, anywhere, but especially <laughs> in predominantly black neighborhoods, which, for those of you who know Chicago, are on the south side of Chicago, much like the 16th Street divide in D.C., the loop here is the divide between um, whites and blacks in Chicago, and so basically what you see is whites unwilling to move to black neighborhoods. Um, and similar for whites moving to Latino neighborhoods, but they, these are much more similar once you control for, for income. So Hispanics actually end up looking a lot like whites when you control for income. And so this is evidence of the fact that whites are unwilling to consider, which leads to this long-term racial succession, which is really important to think about when we think about the future of inequality, that what we think is stable integrated neighborhoods are actually not that stable and are changing to be more racially segregated. The next step of what we want to do with this is instead of having paper maps, because that's, you know, so 20, 20th century, is to put these on a tablet. And so what we, we got money from the National Science Foundation to build an instrument, um, and we actually just got this prototype yesterday um, that shows a tablet map, and now you can select any one of the 313 communities in the Chicago metropolitan area, and we can ask a whole lot more questions about it. So we can ask, do you know about these places? Have you ever spent time there? Um, where have you ever lived, where are your friends and family, so we can see if people are moving near friends and family, and they can touch each of these dots, they can, or each of these polygons, they can touch and say, I, want, I would consider here, 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 and here, and now we can ask questions about, follow-up questions about those neighborhoods as well, because it's all digital. So that's where we're moving now, we're submitting a grant probably next year to NSF to take the instrument which they funded to actually field a, nat a, a not nationally, a, a representative sample of the Chicago metropolitan area uh, to ask about. So the second um, major piece of research is building on technology as well, and Nancy mentioned this in, in her kind intro of me, was thinking about how to use <coughs> Google Street View for social research. And so the, the question that I answer in this is how do we leverage globally available data to compare metros across the country and across the world, right? So Google Street View, I'm sure you've all used at some point to try and find out where you're going, is now a worldwide resource. We can ask the same questions of every place in the United States and not have to travel there and therefore use essentially big data to say to compare metropolitan areas. And so one of the problems has been scholars have studied DC or Chicago or New York, and it's been very hard to compare across because different protocols have been used and, and all the measurement errors associated with that. And so what we're hoping to do is do a nationwide study where we uh, build out um, a mechanical Turk system, and I'm talking to Bei Xiao in computer science to, to figure out how to use mechan Amazon Mechanical Turks, which you essentially pay like seven cents an observation, and have them get lots and lots of observations so we can do this kind of observation across the country and then create maps like this, hopefully for DC and all the metropolitan areas in the, in the country. So that's the, the past and the the kind of past and the present, where I think we need to go in the future is to think about um, data in a sense, rather than just focusing on big data, which is you know kind of the, the buzzword or something now, but to think about, I like to think about as Goldilocks data. What's the right data for the question that we have? And so one of the things that I want to advocate that we think about is, as a Metropolitan Policy Center is thinking about the middle range data, right? So you can have tiny data, which I think of, no offense, Derek, but the kind of work you do where you really study and know Shaw, right? You know Shaw very, very well and big data being these kind of global studies that I'm able to do, but where we're really missing, I think, in terms of literature, are middle data to really understand change over time, right? And so that's where I think we really need to focus our efforts because there are a lot of people working on this, there are a lot of people working on this, I think there are far fewer people working on longitudinal change in this kind of middle range of data to understand why people do what they do using surveys and other such things. And so to do that, we are piloting a DC area survey which we hope eventually to become an annual survey of DC area residents that focuses right now on neighborhoods, health, organizations, and violence, um, asking about all those questions. And it's an interdisciplinary effort um, across most of the schools on campus. If you're not one of the schools involved, please let me know. We'd be happy to have more people. Um, <laughs> and so what we're trying to do is, is create this, this resource and what we would love to do is get um, some more money. So we've gotten, uh, as Derek mentioned, funding generously provided by um, John Tubman's office for this faculty research support grant from the Center on uh, Latin American Latino Studies and from NPC <coughs> and some from the Center on Health and Society. But what we would love to do is think about... Co-God. Co and Co-God as well. Yeah, that was the last one, sorry. And Co-God as well. 
um, to pilot this and what we're hoping, um, not to be too direct, Scott, but as you think about the budget in the next couple of years, think about what might be possible in terms of funding something like this um, so that we can get it started. So I think if we can get it started, we can leverage that starting a um, couple years to try and get community sponsors or media sponsors or other types of groups to, to sponsor this in the long term. Um, so I think it's a strategic investment as we think about the future of, of not necessarily going to areas where, say, NYU or um, Harvard have in the big data realm, but trying to understand, connect big data to the kind of reasoned and middle data that we really need. So that's why I hope we'll be moving in the future, and uh, I look forward to the comments and questions afterwards. Thank you. to uh, reiterate thank yous all around um, to everyone, and especially Derek and his team of student assistants who are really are very dynamic and have really um, made the NPC very effective in less than a year. So thank you very much. So <clears throat> two of the most challenging questions for global urbanism in the 21st century would have to be, first, how will cities ensure adequate and safe water? for its expanding underserved populations? And second, which is a sort of flip side of that question, how can cities address the growing problem of unequal flood risk? Both of these questions become all the more urgent and vexing when you add an important set of givens. And those givens, I would contend, are again two things. First, widespread informal urbanism, and I'll define what I mean by that in a second an increasing climate risk. Right? We're living in an age where we know that future climate events, future weather events, are bound to be more intense in nature, and that cities, both across cities and within cities, are going to be differentially vulnerable, with different populations and different systems within them being vulnerable. Now, what do I mean by informal urbanism? What I mean by that is that urbanization in most of the world is proceeding apace through a different logic than it did in most of the Western world. A logic that has come to be called informal in the scholarly and practitioner literatures. Now, I'm not just talking about slum, <coughs> which is a pet peeve of mine, which is that it tends to be used as a gloss for a great variety of unofficial settlements. I'm talking about a more generalized process of urban development, which is fundamentally flexible and improvisational in nature in which residents and the state are kind of making up the rules as they go, including the rules surrounding housing, planning, and infrastructure, such that most of urban form exists in a state of extra legality. So in today's talk, I will discuss how my research is addressing these two big questions, given these givens. Um, and I'll be discussing how my work contributes to the scholarly frameworks of urban political ecology and environmental justice, rooted in the geography, sociology, anthropology, and also development studies literature. So in, in and of themselves, these fields are very interdisciplinary. I will discuss one of my most important findings pertaining to what I am calling the politics of belonging, based on ethnographic research in Bangalore, India, as well as my evolving research on climate justice in Washington, D.C. Okay, let's start with Bangalore a place that I've studied for about a decade now, and a place that provides a good lens into urbanization in developing Asia more generally. So Bangalore, um, pictured here in the map, and in fact the blue area outlined there is a place where I've done a lot of my field work, is a small city of eight and a half million people. Um, it's uh, the fifth largest uh, metropolitan region in India. Um, and it's about exactly the size of New York City, both in terms of population and area. It's about 300 square miles. With its IT sector contributing uh, a third of India's IT exports and a young, educated workforce, the city is often seen as a poster child for India's millennial economic transformations. In fact, the city has this dubious distinction of becoming a verb uh, in the English Urban Dictionary. To be Bangalore means to be unceremoniously replaced when one's job is it has been sent overseas, <laughs> the topic of some unsuccessful TV shows and films in the US. 
um, recently. So, so but, you know, Bangalore has been very much in the kind of uh, in global imagination as far as cities goes, and, and has a sort of reputation that, that precedes it. Yet the city has also been haunted by a so-called water crisis. It sits about um, uh, 3,000 feet above sea level and actually has no dedicated water source of its own. But what makes this crisis interesting is that there are competing understandings of what it is and what should be done about it. On the one hand, witness this collection of newspaper articles um, you know, with, with headlines such as water crisis looms over Bangalore and fragmented management. Where's the water? And it's sort of this Malthusian narrative where urban population growth is outstripping supply, right? And, and, there's, and we're facing imminent shortages. On the other hand, you also see a set of more optimistic narratives emerging. Those to do with what I would call a best practice kind of narrative. This is a city that has been financed by five different international development agencies for its policy reforms in the water sector. These are changes that have introduced new market-based practices, including increasing water tariffs, including shutting off public taps in slums and other informal areas so that utilities can better recover costs. And these are strategies to brand the city as being competitive, financially viable, and, you know, and, 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 and really to, to pitch the water sector as doing very well as far as fi the financial sustainability of it goes. Now this la language is reflective of India's self-congratulatory tone regarding its economic liberalization and market-based policy shifts over the last two decades. So at a basic level, my research sets out to problematize both these prevailing narratives, to dig deeper to understand what's going on. My primary research question centers on the following. How, in, in parentheses, are, are they at all, how are existing market-driven water policies addressing the problem of inequitable and unsustainable access to water, and with what effects? Now, much of the literature so far on urban water politics has tended to focus on urban water privatization and protests, particularly in Latin America, with very little on the actual effects of and politics surrounding urban water policies um, since then. So there's a real need to do a careful analysis of what happens when you implement these policies. How do people respond? Do, does it actually fill access gaps where, where they're needed? And I've been really uh, inspired by ethnographies of how development works, right? how does it actually work, um, rather than just, uh, persistently critiquing its, its, uh, its outcomes. So, so it's, a lot of my work is inspired by ethnography of, de of development, as was read out in my, in my introduction as well. So to answer this question, and I'm not sure, uh, Mike, if this fits under middle data or small data or what, but, but I, I, I rely on a multi-scaled ethnographic approach. Um, and and over, the, uh, over the last few years, I've, I've conducted hundreds of interviews um, scaling the global city, state scale, and the neighborhood scale. So if in, at the global scale, I've interviewed urban finance and water specialists. I was actually an undercover agent at the Asian Development Bank for a few months to kind of understand the discourses uh, um, that, that experts use to frame urban water policy um, and, and what, what the goals are here. At the city scale, I interviewed experts who are at the forefront of implementing these because I'd like to trace how decision making um, flows from different scales and how policy models get replicated and transferred. And finally, much of my time was spent in conversations with local officials, residents, and resident welfare associations. Um, including uh, several several hours, several hundreds of hours of participant observation in, in informal neighborhoods before and after new policies were implemented. So I focused my field work uh, largely on the outskirts of Bangalore, which is a really an area of extraordinarily rapid growth. In fact, over the last 10 years, you can see very little population change in the urban core, but extraordinarily rapid growth in the urban periphery. Now, what does urban periphery look like? And, 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 and what's happening here, and it's really important that we get insight into this because it's really the mode of urbanization in most of the world. So unlike in the core parts of the city, and arguably the logic that happens in, in let's say, a place like DC, um, where neighborhoods are planned and infrastructure is put in place and people then move in, uh, in, in informal neighborhoods in the global south, the actual reverse is true. So people move in first, often on land that's not zoned for residential use, um, and, and they gradually make improvements to their settlements over time, including investments in roads and drains and water. And the local state participates in often contradictory ways, often legitimating the settlement, but other times policing them. So, so in other work, I've also kind of unpacked the role of the state in these informal neighborhoods. 
Now, this is an aerial view of the urban periphery. But this could be an urban periphery anywhere, right? Ten years staggered, Google Earth. Very helpful. Um, and well, you can see the enormous rate of growth of settlements over ten years. And this is the mode in which they're happening. People are settling, people are moving to the city for jobs, for other reasons. And, they're, and, and, and this is the sort of informality is the new norm, right? Informal urbanization is the new norm. So what happens when you experiment with new water policies in this messy spatial context where people have historically had to negotiate for the right to belong, the right to land tenure, and the right to services? Overall, my research finds that existing water policies tend to be narrowly focused on the financial indicators rather than ensuring universal water supply or even ensuring the long-term ecological viability of the water sector. Crucially, urban water policy tends to be disconnected from land policy. Right? So, and, and, and so, so there's actually a real need for a more interdisciplinary policy making process because it tends to be divorced from spatial realities. And this is one of the contributions I make both to the scholarly and the practitioner literature. So for instance, one of the reform projects I looked at was financed by USAID, the Asian Development Bank, and several international development agencies, um, you know, was, was implemented in, on the outskirts of Bangalore. But um, what ended up happening, as many, much of my ethnographic interviews demonstrated, is that people were paying for the water, for the supposed water, in order to be legitimated in the eyes of the state, in order for their land tenure to be taken seriously. So much of my ethnographic interviews demonstrated the intersections between water and water policies and the politics of belonging and citizenship. When I delved further into these new water policies, I discovered that the reason why that best practice narrative is in some ways tenable, and, and in fact they have been successful at raising revenue, is because those with insecure land tenure, the majority of the city that lives on the outskirts, were trying to use payment for water to assert their right to belong in the city, as I said, to legitimate their land tenure, as seen by uh, this, this image of a, of a lady presenting her bill for water and, and sort of arguing, how can you then see me as illegal, right? So con connections are made on the ground that you wouldn't otherwise find out if you just study the policy in isolation in a sort of vacuum. Water policies have these unintended effects of stoking claims to the right to the city, even if those policies don't necessarily result in improved water access or sustainability. So the overall take home for global urban water policy uh, is that it must be more cognizant of these unintended effects and better connect with urban land policy and housing policy, because it's going to have to deal with such struggles, right? So a more flexible set of technical and governance approaches that don't rely on the standard approaches, uh, including you know, large capital-intensive infrastructure and these, and these uh, pricing policies, and that recognizes a multiplicity of land tenures is kind of the need of the hour here. In this world where, as I said, informality and struggles over the right to the city tend to dominate. So I use this insight about the politics of belonging being so crucial, crucial to urban ecology to inform my ongoing projects. I am currently researching what explains heightened flood risk again in Bangalore. And similarly here, I find that it is often those who are most at risk uh, from being displaced economically or being displaced because their land tenure is insecure, who are also most at risk of being displaced from flooding. Right? So you want to study ecological <coughs> issues alongside spatial and land issues. And this is exactly why I'm so excited to now start research on BC. And before I start that, um, I, want to, I want to say that um, there's this growing enthusiasm uh, in the scholarly world for connecting experiences and theoretical insights from cities in the global south to the global north and vice versa in order to break down long-standing epistemic and geographic boundaries between the two. So this is an intellectual project I'm committed to and have recently published on with a colleague um, at UC Davis comparing actually water access in smaller urban areas in California and India and recognizing that there's a lot going on that, that is intellectually fruitful to bring into conversation. For instance, US scholars can learn from the literature on urban informality, relations with the state, and claims to shelter, just as much as scholars of southern cities can learn about the politics of gentrification and housing in the north. So DC coming now to um, the final few minutes uh, of my talk. DC is particularly susceptible to the negative and unjust effects of climate change. About $9 billion worth of property is less than 10 feet above the high tide line, right? This is a way in which 
climatologists and our urban planners measure uh, vulnerability. And it's likely to see record flooding by 2040 under a mid-range mid sea level rise scenario. So keeping that in mind, um, I'm currently working um, with Dr. Eve Bratman, uh, an SIS professor as well, on a project funded by the MPC titled Tackling Urban Vulnerability, Lessons for Building Community Resilience and Climate Justice in DC. <coughs> and we're interested in two questions here. And as you can see, I bring through that thread of understanding the role of displacement and struggles around displacement also in building uh, ecological uh, viability and sustainability. And so I'm, I, again, bringing through that thread because I find it to be such an important connection in, uh, in, in, you know, in my research in India and elsewhere that I've, 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 I've sort of used that as a, as a way to frame the research here. So firstly, how and why are DC residents vulnerable to climate-related disruptions? And what are these communities currently do, doing to cope with shocks? And what, if anything, can be learned from existing strategies around displacement and gentrification for fostering resilience to climate disruption? So where, how do we go about this? Well, so this is a, a, a map, a vulnerability map from climatecentral.org, which is a, 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 it's really a collaborative of several uh, geography scholars um, who have, have, have spent a while doing vulnerability mapping, right? And so it's an it's a interactive uh, web and ALGIS platform where you can go in you can select which city in the United States you're interested in. You can select which sea level scenario you're looking at, right? And then you can look at which areas on the map are likely to be vulnerable. And uh, the authors have come up with their social vulnerability index, and you can look at the methods there. Right? And so we're trying to uh, focus on areas that are likely to be vulnerable with actually, in, the, in this sense, of kind of a minimal sea level rise to understand what are existing community strategies for dealing with extreme weather, for disruptions, um, and so we've selected two neighborhoods, uh, Eastland Gardens and Kenilworth Parkside, as well as the Gangplank Marina. Um, the Eastland uh, Gardens case is, is in, located in Northeast DC in Ward 7, and this community is primarily African American, and is comp uh, comprised of a mix of single family residences and public housing buildings. Uh, the second case is, is, a, is a more of a, a, a mixed race, uh, mixed income neighborhood, but is also very near the water and is likely to be uh, vulnerable to, to uh, rising sea levels. So the centerpiece of this research, and maybe this is more of a mid-level um, kind of approach, uh, will involve the deployment of a survey instrument for 150 households, so uh, split over the two areas, um, to gather micro-level data on how people have historically responded to weather disruptions, and what community networks they're, they're part of, and what sort of assets they own or, or do not own that makes them particularly vulnerable to weather-related disruptions. So this research will be supplemented by uh, in-depth participant observation in, com in community gatherings and neighborhood meetings um, in order to understand, again, what sort of uh, social networks are people part of or not that actually enable them to build uh, uh, resilience um, and enable them to mitigate potential vulnerabilities that are likely to occur. It turns out that, pe that you know, different funding agencies are really interested in these micro-level assessments because that is actually very much lacking as far as you understand kind of the, the larger uh, picture of DC you know, likely to, to face $9 billion worth of potential losses, but you don't really understand these situated vulnerabilities. And so this is something I'm hoping to, um, to use to contribute to both uh, gaps in, in both the practitioner world as well as the scholarly world. So we're looking forward to starting this project and indeed Grateful to MPCs uh, for this for the support for this project. So thanks a lot. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, so, uh, you know, happy to kind of finish out here and, um, uh, yeah. you know, really grateful to the MPC and to um, School of Public Affairs uh, for the support on this project. Also, whenever I talk about this work uh, focused on D.C., uh, very much uh, want to thank the Upjohn Institute for Employment Research uh, that provided some funding as well, and the Metropolitan Policy Center. So. Um, 
the, the question uh, in the most specific sense is focused on uh, the District of Columbia's refundable earned income tax credit. Uh, but we've engaged in uh, a pretty substantial uh, data creation exercise. We've created a longitudinal panel data set using tax data uh, from 2001 to 2011 in the hopes that we can uh, answer some of the types of questions that you all raised here today. Uh, stuff focused on neighborhood change, uh, gentrification, and, and these types of phenomena that, that coincide with some uh, what I'll argue, uh, pretty progressive public policies throughout Washington, D.C., uh, one of which is the earned income credit that I'll talk about today, uh, but some others that I'll make passing reference to as well. So uh, really wanted to kind of overview the, the preliminary results we have in looking at this uh, EITC policy, tell you a little bit about what it is and why it matters, why you should care. Uh, so uh, you know, you've been motivated sufficiently uh, you know that D.C. is a place where you got prosperity. Uh, median incomes, roughly $10,000 above the national average, but at the same time, the poverty rate is far higher as well. Uh, so, um, you know, this is a challenge uh, for, the, for the local community. And, you know, <coughs> D.C. policymakers, like other city policymakers nationwide, have been thinking about a bunch of public policies to combat the problem of poverty and inequality. Uh, think about minimum wage policy. Uh, you can also think about this tax policy that I'll tell you a bit more about. Uh, so, you know, the research questions, can tax policies actually reduce poverty? We're thinking about the earned income tax credit. This is essentially a wage subsidy administered through the tax code. So, the part about it being through the tax code is a bit inefficient, but what we've got operating here is a program where we're bumping up the, the wages of, of the working poor. And so the question that I'm tackling with a, a research team is whether and how the policy reduces poverty on a longer term basis, uh, whether the, the policy uh, reduces the volatility of incomes, uh, important questions for these low income households, oftentimes at greater exposure to job loss, uh, oftentimes in and out of the part time work sector, so, so that's the question um, where we've got some results that I'll talk about today. But, but the quite intensive data creation exercise uh, we hope leads to being able to answer uh, questions about gentrification uh, and then maybe putting the two together to think about whether and how DC's public policies might actually be arresting or slowing down the gentrification patterns uh, that we know are in evidence. So, you know, the, the parts in gray are, uh, you know, they're in the idea <laughs> close to the beginning stage, but we've actually got results uh, with respect to DC's uh, refundable earned income tax credit. Uh, so, uh, you know, the background of the EITC, and I won't spend uh, too much time here. You, you, you can come to my social policy class at 530 and learn a little more. Uh, <laughs> but the EITC started as a counterproposal to a very uh, aggressive idea for a, a family assistance program and Nixon's uh, negative income tax proposals that would be guaranteed income uh, for folks who are out of work. And so it started as a counterproposal, very modest wage supplement. Uh, but it's grown on a national level. There, there's a federal earned income tax credit. Uh, but then states have enacted their own version, as well as cities. So Montgomery County has one, and, and obviously D.C. has one as well, uh, the subject of which um, you know, we're here to you know, talk about today. So this is a big program. Uh, if you were to look at the trend in spending, I don't know what your priors were about the structure of the social safety net in this country, but uh, cash welfare, if you look at the, the green trend, uh, is uh, pretty small in comparison to the size of the federal uh, earned income tax credit as a uh, cash supplement for the, for the poor and near poor. Only, you know, sort of outpaced by food stamps, and that's frankly a direct impact of uh, the, the Great Recession. So, so this is a pretty large program. So, you know, when I raise the question of whether or not we think tax policies can reduce poverty, um, you might say, boy, I, I hope they do, because we're spending a lot of money. Uh, so, you know, um, 
the distribution across the nation, if you look at the darker blue states, uh, you're going to see uh, uh, whether or not they have a, a state EITC and the intensity of it. And so surrounding D.C., you can tell that um, Virginia and Maryland have a refundable credit, though it's important to note that, uh, excuse me, I misspoke, the Virginia credit is not refundable. So, so, you know, in the weeds here a little bit, but the point is that their goal is to essentially offset any tax burden uh, that a low-income working filer has. Uh, versus in D.C., where uh, the working poor can actually walk away with pretty substantial uh, cash. So, you know, we've known that on some federal level that the program uh, has some poverty reduction impacts. Uh, the thinking is that by making work pay, it, it actually induces uh, some people to enter the labor force who otherwise might uh, not see it as being worthwhile. Uh, so that's interesting on the federal level. For us, we want to think about the, the local supplement along with the federal EITC. We want to understand the impact on long-term poverty and the uh, instability or volatility of incomes. Uh, so why does this matter? We don't see much policy activity on poverty policy at the federal level, by and large. Uh, if you all have followed the news and you see uh, the lack of action in Congress on even relatively small affairs. States and cities are doing their own thing. They're thinking about minimum wages. They're also thinking about this EITC. But, you know, I think many people don't realize that the District of Columbia <coughs> has uh, the most generous refundable earned income tax credit in the nation. Uh, and so this started in the early 2000s. And um, to our knowledge, we haven't seen any rigorous evaluation of the program. So, you know, we think this is really important because other cities are going to be looking to see if the programs are effective. You know, uh, my colleague at Rutgers, uh, uh, Bill Rogers, uh, former chief economist in the uh, Labor Department, he's um, being pretty vocal about uh, increasing New Jersey's uh, earned income credit to 30% uh, from 20 so, you know, people are looking to see if these policies matter. And, and so what we've done is collaborated with economists in D.C. government's uh, Office of Revenue Analysis. It's the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. Uh, as an interesting sort of D.C. policy aside, uh, it's fascinating to look into the relationship between the Chief Financial Officer in D.C. and the Mayor and the City Council. and. and he has this degree of autonomy in approving his budget and certifying the budget that the, that the mayor and the council come to some agreement on. And so there's a fascinating separation there for people who are kind of interested in the workings of uh, this very unique local government. Uh, so, so folks in, in the office of the chief financial uh, officer have been very uh, generous and welcoming uh, to both me and my doctoral student, Rucha Samudra. Uh, the results I'll talk about today are with Daniel Muhammad, a uh, property tax economist uh, in the D.C. Uh, Office of Revenue Analysis. And, and so, you know, these folks are very much uh, worried about estimating revenues on an annual basis. So they've got a cross-section of data. The form you fill out if you're a D.C. Revenant, resident, they have that on the computer screen. And they want to do research, but at the same time, they're not necessarily structured to be thinking about this data in a panel uh, design where you can follow the tax filers over time. Which is just to say that um, you know, I, along with Rucha, spent many months trying to take this <coughs> tax data and, and, and construct what's called a panel. And, and so for some of the students in the room, if you think about a data set like the panel study of income dynamics that's already following those individuals over time, well, then we're, we're trying to create a panel, you know, in this similar spirit. Uh, so that was, you know, sort of a fun and, and useful process. But, but that was the goal, right, to be able to follow uh, these tax filing residents over time in the 2000s. And, and I guess another side is that this program, and I'll show you some of the dollar amounts, is pretty generous, and it, it coincides with this growth in the city. So, you know, the... 
DC refundable earned income tax credit is enacted in 2001, and it gets progressively more generous over time. And this is the same period of time when you have folks moving into the city, uh, tax revenues are on the rise. Uh, I believe that Mayor Tony Williams was, was uh, in office in the early 2000s and was you know, largely credited with, with putting the city on a pretty firm financial base. So, you know, that's sort of the backdrop. And if you want to understand on the federal level what kind of money we're talking about, uh, by 2014, uh, a filer with three or more kids would receive a, a refundable credit on the federal level of over $6,000, then take 40% of that, that's DC's version that they're kicking in. So if you think about low-income families that are maybe bringing in at the top of the threshold around $22,000, $23,000, this is pretty serious money. So, you know, I love talking about this stuff, so I talk more offline. I'll try to move through this quickly. We find that uh, the program does reduce uh, the likelihood, uh, or, or increase rather, the likelihood of uh, having income uh, above the poverty line on a longer term basis. We're talking uh, you know, consistently and continuously two years out after initial receipt of the EITC. And we also find that the program does provide some insurance and stabilize incomes over time as well which is sort of what you expect, um, but, but we're, we're encouraged and we, we still have more to do. Uh, the empirical strategy is basically a difference in differences approach. And happy to talk about the econometrics of that, um, but we have models for long-term poverty and income volatility as well. Uh, so, you know, can tax policies reduce poverty and we say, you know, a qualified yes, but certainly there's concerns because you're talking about administering a, a wage subsidy through the tax code. Think about poor families who are receiving a lump sum right around now. I still have to finish my taxes, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, right? You, you know, so there's a lot of very strong uh, qualitative evidence uh, by Sarah Halper Meekin and, and Kathy Eden talking about how families perceive and utilize their earned income credit. They, they're, they're paying bills down that are overdue. They're making longer due, overdue repairs. Maybe some evidence that it, it provides a, an opportunity to save. So, you know, policymakers have thought hard about, um, you know, bringing back a policy called advanced EITC, uh, which essentially takes that earned income credit, changes it from a lump sum, and makes it more of a monthly installment. Uh, but that was done away with in 2011. So um, in, in, in work uh, with uh, colleagues Tim Smeeting and Jim Zilliak, uh, we're finding that there's longer term uh, reliance on both food stamps and the earned income credit as essentially permanent work supports. So, you know, we're, we're optimistic and happy that uh, the, the, the policy is reducing poverty in D.C. We think that this is a very important result for the cities and states. Um, but, but it also suggests uh, in some other work that um, you have some people who have permanently flat wages. And, and, and so um, that's something to be concerned about. Finally, uh, all that work on trying to get this data straight <laughs> Is, is with an eye towards asking some other questions. And so some of the folks in NPC, uh, you know, I want to work with researchers to think hard about uh, gentrification trends, um, the public policies in DC, not just the earned income credit, but DC has one of the most generous pre-K programs around. So this is uh, an entitlement program, so if you're a resident, you know, your, your kid qualifies for a very generous pre-K program, above and beyond uh, Head Start. The city also uh, is introducing pretty aggressive minimum wage policies. And so, you know, the idea is not just to rely on the tax data alone, but it's to take the tax data and then augment that with some of the survey data we have from the U.S. Census Bureau so we can be more confident in, in what's going on in D.C.
That's it. Uh, happy to get some comments and questions. Thanks. So why don't I pull the panel up here and face the audience and take any questions you have. I want to get up and get a cookie or you know, some coffee or, or lemonade. Do that too while we uh, rearrange ourselves a little bit. So you see, I mean, within MPC, you see the breadth of research approaches and also disciplinary backgrounds. I'm following you as a uh, geographer. I'm a sociologist uh, slash political scientist slash urban planner. Uh, Mike is a, an urban sociologist and Bradley is an economist. And I think with the presentations you really see we're going after some similar but some different questions but with different, definitely different methodologies and different theoretical approaches. And I think that's what makes it so rich. All right, so questions for any of us. Okay. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Explain gentrification. <laughs> Not the gentrification? Yes. I don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I'll be in the economist. Well, so gentrification is really just when uh, an upper income population moves into a lower income area, and that process puts pressure on the lower income residents to stay. Usually they get uh, displaced physically uh, because they have a tough time paying um, higher rents. Um, and But uh, also, and usually people in the U.S. context look at that as, as white gentrification because it usually is whites um, moving in. But I've studied areas such as Harlem and the south side of Chicago where upper income African Americans have moved into a, uh, an African American dominated neighborhood. So you have black gentrification. And really in Shaw U Street in the early 90s, you had multiracial gentrification and upper income whites, blacks, Hispanics, uh, Asians moving into that area. But in the 2000s, it's really kind of been the traditional white gentrification. Is that someone answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Bradley, um, so the other side of the equation is how the EITC and DC is funded. So I, I don't know much about the DC uh, um, revenue base. Is it primarily property taxes, for example? Is it primarily sales taxes? In other words, does the way the revenue is collected undermine the gains of the EITC? It's an interesting question. You know, I, and I, I haven't explored this. What, what, I can, what I can tell you is that, and I'm answering sort of another question. I, I want to acknowledge that. Uh, you know, there was a very aggressive outreach effort on the part of folks uh, like Ed Lazier at the D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. And the story that gets told is that, uh, quite simply, uh, coincident with a pretty pretty dramatic increase in the city's revenues. Uh, there was a sense that they were able to do something about this, and that the earned income credit was a pretty agreeable public policy, uh, in the sense that it's putting money in the hands of the working poor. Uh, but but it doesn't, it leaves unanswered the question, you know, how to make finance. I think it's a good question. Could, yeah. Could I, just add on? Yeah, please. I think what's so interesting is that DC has a generous um, tax policy in terms of the, the earned income tax credit, but yet in the time period when it was implemented, inequality grew. Um, so it's just interesting that you know they've implemented a policy that is extremely generous. You think you would see poverty reductions with that policy, but and and Bradley has shown for the individuals who have received that over time, yes, they get out of poverty. So for the city as a whole, inequality grew. Uh, during that time period that yeah. the, the policy was enacted. And I think that's just, just interesting to well, see that. No, I think that's right. I, I think that also your your is sort of a larger question about how much government can do. Uh, there's been structural change in the U.S. economy, and that's no different in D.C. So um, we have a pretty big and growing service labor market where the wages just haven't uh, grown, and that's not, not just here in D.C. So, um, you know, the, the poverty definition, uh, the standard poverty definition won't take into account uh, transfers like uh, food stamps or the EITC, and I think it's good to do it before and after because we should be concerned if earnings uh, without these supplements uh, aren't sufficient to lift people above poverty.
As a question for Dr. Hardy, um, what's the advantage of the EITC over, say, like a direct cash payment to low income? Sure, no, that's a that's a great question. So, I think as as envisioned um, by the proponents and even folks who were thinking about um, so-called sort of, you know, negative income taxes, the idea is that it provides a, a work incentive. So, so I guess the extreme counterexample or counter problem is that many social scientists have spent years uh, worrying about uh, trying to think about the non-technical way of putting it, but it's it's the idea that social programs uh, could create work disincentives. Uh, and so that might seem crazy in this room, but, but people worry about the notion that as you <coughs> begin to make more money and no longer qualify for a housing benefit or a, a Medicaid benefit, uh, or back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, cash assistance, that that's a, essentially an implicit tax. And that on the margin, if your, your work prospects aren't strong enough, it may not make sense to earn that next dollar and then lose those key benefits. Well, the idea that folks tend to like about the EITC is that it's actually sort of paying people to work more and earn more up to a point. The, the program does phase out ultimately, but it's generally thought of as a program that induces people into work. And, and certainly the discussion throughout the, I'd say the, the 60s, 70s, and 80s was a lot about the link between poverty and non-participation or you know, people not working. So proponents and people who ended up you know, helping this program to grow into what it is, which is a you know, 60 billion plus uh, program, like the idea that it, it made work pay. Yeah. Um, can I add a yeah. little bit more to that? I mean, you think about uh, a policy like Section 8 um, housing subsidy or public housing. You don't have to earn money to receive that benefit. If some people in there are unemployed or, or and but with the earned income tax credit, if you're not working, you're not getting the benefit. So that's sort of the, the rub with this is that there are people who have difficult finding work, and the earned income tax credit doesn't do anything for them because you actually have to earn money to get the credit. So, um, but there are other subsidies or part of the safety net that for people who are not working, they could receive a benefit. Um, so that's yeah. important. So that's, that's a good mentioned. question. See, you know, former students ask good questions here. So, you know, <laughs> and current students. Only thing, fine, so so, so I, I'd add on to that that this is also made worse because we reformed cash welfare in 1996. So this is a program where you know you can no longer, in many states, receive that that cash supplement for a meaningful amount of time. So it, it's not just one public policy, but it's how the whole safety net fits together. And, and so that cash assistance has become far more temporary. If you have these disconnected folks who, for whatever reason, can't find jobs, then they're not receiving any welfare benefits. Before the next question, I just want to uh, note that Johnson Johnson is here, uh, who is also an NPC faculty fellow, and Daniel Esser is back there. I know you had a presentation earlier this morning. I'm surprised you're not taking a nap or getting a, 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 a beer. Uh, at, the more here. research, the better. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, two other faculty uh, fellows of the Metropolitan Policy Center. So thanks for thanks for being here. Uh, so other other questions. This is for all the panelists. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. It's just kind of about urban uh, urban research in DC itself. Uh, two of you said that you're kind of newer to the research, but why why noticing that there was all these problems? Why hasn't there been attention on it? This is the capital city of the United States, and there's power. And I know this is something that you guys will find out as you continue to exploring, but what do you guys think about that um, paradox? Uh, well, yeah, I, mean, I, can, I can venture an answer. This is something we talk about in my classes quite a bit, um, because I teach a lot on global urbanism, but I always bring it back home. Because <coughs> there's so many interesting questions here. And I had, um, you know, my RAs do a, a literature review on books 
and articles published on DC. And what they came up with was some good work that was done a while ago, but nothing very contemporary. Because a lot of great books written in LA and New York, you know, in the urban sociology, urban geography tradition. And I, I, I think what's happened is because DC is just this hub, this sort of, of, of international development, international you know, global efforts, um, and it's, it's this sort of federal um, city. It's, it's kind of literally off the map as far as urban studies go. It has such a federal, like it's been rescaled, you know, to use a very ge geographic term, to be a very um, <coughs> a, a, a federal sort of entity. Uh, so that's my that's my two cents. Um, but I'm sure. Yeah, we, no, I was just. I would say, I, would say I, I agree completely. So you go back to the '60s. There was Tally's Corner, which Derek mentioned. There's Soul Side. Um, Lee Siegelman, who passed away a couple years ago, was at GW, had done some great quantitative research, he's a political scientist that worked a lot with, in sociology as well. Um, and so I think while I'm exactly right, I think the focus became much more in DC on kind of international and, and national level concerns. Um, and not to be obsequious, but I think there wasn't, Scott, I think there was an opportunity here too because there wasn't the kind of focused local effort that there had been in any of the local institutions. And so I think that, that I think institutions matter a lot. And so I think that having and I think that, you know, for example, in sociology, the sociology departments here um, had tended to focus on kind of international again, international type research. Um, what we really also needed was interdisciplinary research. I think that like the the universities in DC tend to be smaller than say University of Chicago or NYU or Columbia or UCLA where a lot of this work was being done where you could have a very strong single department until you started working interdisciplinary. I think that interdisciplinarily I think that that hindered research in DC. Um, the only other thing I would add is there's a lot of federal research that's done on DC and so there's a lot of like pilot testing of data that like say the Census Bureau does or and um, the National Center for Crime Statistics does, or NHI, and the National Center for Health Statistics. So a lot of that gets focus grouped in DC, but it's not necessarily academic work that gets published and disseminated. <coughs> so. I'll add a couple things to that. I mean, one, definitely scholars would pass up here because uh, they would say that, well, what happens here won't generalize. This is a federal government town. All the jobs, you know, if the federal government goes up, then DC develops. If the federal government pulls back in terms of it's financing, then the city goes down. It's, it's like so, so it's an exception, right? But but New York's an exception. Right. Right? There's only one Wall Street, right? right. So but, but people study the heck right. out of uh, Washington D.C. I mean, out of New York City, and then also there's only one Chicago machine. The politics of Chicago are so unique, but yet there was a Chicago school. Um, and but I think that now the federal government doesn't dominate as much as they did, and now there are more scholars saying, "Hey, what's happening here may actually generalize to to other cities." Uh, but another point. You know, these other cities, New York and Chicago, they have strong foundations that pump a lot of money into the university system to do research about those cities. Now, there are family foundations here, but they have chosen to pump their money into social services and not research. And it relates back to Mike's point that the federal government did do a lot of pilot testing, did do a lot of research here, and there's a lot of poverty here. Um, and so these family foundations said, you know what? We don't want any more research here. It's enough. We have poverty. We want to address it directly by getting money to social services to try to alleviate some of the, the poor conditions here. So the funding apparatus for research is not as great in the Washington, D.C. area. Also, Washington, D.C. never had industry, right? It's the federal government, right? So who, who are the ones that could fund research here? Well, it's the real estate development community. And they're not the ones who are really going to fund the type of research we just discussed today. Um, so th there are reasons. You know that there hasn't been a show, I mean, a real Washington D.C. school of studies, but I think we collectively are building that, and we are affiliating with Maryland and George Washington and Georgetown, George Mason, Virginia Tech, and and also the think tanks. We've got Brookings and the Urban Institute, and I think all of us collectively, if we come together, we could produce a vast amount of research <coughs> here that may even dwarf uh, the Chicago School, the New York School, the L.A. School. Um, so it, it's there's an interesting times here and an opportunity. Got it. Um, in the paper about a week ago, I think it was Fry or Brookings was talking about. You talked about migration to uh, cities, and they were saying that in the last two years there's been a blip, and that there's actually a resurgence to exurbs. And I'm curious your thoughts. There's when we're talking about city migration, seems to be another phenomenon that's going on around the country, which 
there perhaps isn't a term, which is um, a facsimile urbanism uh, in the immediate surrounding areas of the city that's replicating the city kinds of structures of uh, large buildings of residential and urban and recreation in, in dense, uh, in great, great density. Well, very different than suburban development over the last uh, you know, 50 years, 60 years. Is there, as I recall the article said that there is yet a clarity of a change in pattern, um, which was uh, very much spurred by the recession. How do you see it and where do you see uh, demographics are headed within the United States in terms of distribution and organization? Uh, I'll jump into it real quick, and then I know uh, Mike once again, so I'll take the latter than the former. The latter, uh, anybody been to the Mosaic District in Fairfax? It is all the DC restaurants moved out to the suburbs, um, and it is a dense area, and all the DC developers have some money in that deal. But when you go out there and you sit in the middle of this Mosaic District, you feel like you're in any city in the country, but you're out in the suburbs. So there is this move to kind of bring the city out to the suburbs. Uh, so we are seeing that development pattern. And that's why I think it's really important the lines between the urban and the suburban are blurring. Um, and Mike's map that, that he produced that I showed kind of shows that in terms of race and ethnicity. And we're seeing that it used to be in the inner core, and now it's moving out to the, the suburbs. So we do need a metropolitan studies. So with the demographic shift, we did have this back to the city movement. Um, that happened in New York, that happened in Chicago in the 90s. Um, and in Chicago, you know, because of the Great Recession in the 2000s, they didn't have a back to the city movement. But it did happen here because disproportionately money was being pumped out from the federal government during the Great Recession, and there were jobs being created here. So people were moving from all these other cities to Was the Washington, D.C. region because there were more jobs here. That job growth has stopped in the last two years because the federal government has pulled back, they've turned off the spigots. Um, so it will be interesting to see. We still have a thousand people per month moving to the Washington D.C. area, even though there aren't jobs here. So I'm like, when's this going to stop? But I think it's just a lagged effect. People still think there are jobs here. They have their their networks here, and so they're moving here. So developers still see there's a demand, and more people are coming, but the jobs aren't here. So at some point, it is going to really slow down. Um, and also the millennials, are they going to stay? Are all of you who live here in the city, are you guys when you have kids going to stay here, or are you going to move out? to the suburbs, and that's a big question. Um, so that will, sort of the infrastructure that DC puts in for affordable housing for, uh, and when I say affordable, <coughs> people will make you know, $80,000 a year, $70,000 a year, it's not really affordable housing, but for DC that is affordable. Um, that's what our students who graduate probably get jobs like that, and there'll be probably more housing opportunities in the suburbs than the city. If the city starts creating that housing stock, I think a lot of you all will stay here. But you might move out to the Mosaic District. So, Mike, so I think I think one of the things that's important is um, I think Derek's right to focus on the back of the city movement, but it was it has never been that most people moving to metropolitan areas have been moving to cities since the 1950s. I mean, since the 1950s, most people moving to metropolitan areas are moving to the suburbs. It's something like 65 percent of people in the country live in suburbs now. So. Um, and I think that that's important to keep in mind. And I think it's also important not to focus, to, I mean, not to, to disparage Derek's work, but not to focus too much on gentrification because we focus too much on gentrification. <coughs> we lose sight of real problems that are emerging in the suburbs. And so I think uh, in DC, we actually have a little bit less of this because the counties are large. And so there's a certain amount of redistribution that can happen within counties. But in places like Chicago or New York, we have very small municipalities. They're going to be in deep trouble real soon. Municipal bonds and other kinds of things that fund nutrition, fund schools, and capital investment. Um, and so I think that that's a wave that's coming probably 10 or 15 years from now, um, when places like Hoboken or Alexandria or uh, Oak Park in Chicago, you know, kind of they, they are trying to become urban and dense, but they and they can do it. But then you have the places like Skokie and, and you know around here. Know, at Falls Church or some of the outlying areas that might, or Prince George's County that might not do as well. Um, I think it's really important to keep in mind to not get so focused on gentrification as a problem and to lose sight of the suburbanization of poverty and suburbanization of problems associated with that. That's what I want, I want to jump in here because this is why, you know, Mike wants to study the suburbs. 
uh, and there's a lot going on there, but I think it's connected to the research that I'm looking at. Why is poverty moving out to the suburbs? It's because of the gentrification. And again, that's why it's the Metropolitan Policy Center, because the dynamics of the central city relate to what's happening in the suburbs. So the poverty is moving out there because the poverty used to be in these central city areas has gent gentrification has happened, and those people are now moving out to the suburbs. So they're, they're so connected, and so we should understand the central city and understand the suburbs, because that will give us the whole complex understanding of these different <coughs> Other questions? I think we're out of time. Well, is there a last question? Yeah, I'll take question. Can you stay around for a little while if people have individual questions? Yeah, let's do individual yeah. questions. So. And that way you can get cookies and coffee or something. And we can thank you for coming today. Well, thank you. Thank you.